now. Yes, I can hear oh, okay. you now. All right. Well, I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the acting director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. And welcome to our July uh, Wyoming Conditions and Outlooks presentation, which is put together by my office, uh, the US Geological Survey, the National Weather Service, the University of Wyoming Extension, and USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, uh, the State Engineer's Office, Bureau of Land Management, and Wyoming State Forestry Division. And this presentation will look at past and current climate conditions followed by surface water, uh, how drought is impacting water rights administration, water weather and uh, forecasts and outlooks, fuels and wildfire outlooks. And then we'll, we'll wrap things up with uh, letting you know how you can get involved and provide some valuable input to us. So this is the, the current drought monitor map. This is a weekly product that spans through each Tuesday and was just released this morning. Uh, but we'll come back to this map in a little bit more detail following the next slide, uh, because there's a number of questions that have arisen in the last month about the makeup of the drought monitor. So let's go into that first. So what is the drought monitor? And first, it might help a little just to say what it is not. It's not based strictly on precipitation. And uh, it's not a forecast. It's not predicting what's gonna be happening or giving any indication of what's coming up. It's not a model. Uh, this is based on, on actual situation on the ground. And it's not a drought declaration. I mean, there are programs that use the categories in it for drought, but the drought monitor itself is not a, uh, a declaration of drought anywhere. And in its simplest terms, it's just a, a weekly depiction of the current conditions, the extent, the, uh, the area that's covered, the severity, you know, what level of drought is going on in a place, and then the time scale, whether it's, you know, short or, or longer term uh, impacts. And it uses, among other things, uh, several, several parameters, that, in fact, uh, the precipitation, stream flow, reservoir levels, uh, temperature, uh, evaporative demand, soil moisture, vegetation health, um, impact reports, and as I said, a slew of other, other parameters that are out there. Not all those parameters have the same weight when it comes to looking at uh, you know, determining a, a category for an area. Some are weighed higher than others, and some are weighed higher than others at different times of the year. So it, it really varies on the location and the time of the year. And the parameters are evaluated in terms of percentiles, uh, not as percents of average, not as percents of the mean, but as, as, a, as a percentile. And say a little bit about that again, uh, they differ from percentages in that they're bounded between zero and 100. And at the 50th percentile, you're at the median value. And this chart over here shows about 120 years, uh, exactly 120 years actually, of uh, annual precipitation totals for a random spot in Wyoming. And I've ordered these from lowest to highest and then broken them into deciles. That is to say that each of these 12 lines in here is 10% of the overall number of values. And we can see the median value is this one right here in the middle. And as I said, it's, the median is not necessarily the average. And in this case, the average is about a quarter of an inch or so higher than the median value. Uh, on here on the left, here's the first set of uh, 10% of the numbers or 12 numbers total. And this area here from here down is considered uh, values that are in the 10th percentile or less. And so another way of looking at that is that these values are less than 90% of all the values, values observed. Uh, the value here is at the 10th percentile, but it's actually about 73% of average or thereabouts. So down here in the lower right, you can see the percentiles that generally define the various levels of drought. And those values up here at the 10th percentile uh, or lower would fall into the category of D2 or worse uh, drought conditions. Uh, one other way of looking at those percentiles is in the terms of probability of occurrence. You could on average expect to see D4 conditions 2% uh, of the time or less. And using a year's analogy, uh, this would be conditions you would expect on average once in 50 years or more. Uh, D3 would be conditions that are, oh, on average, again, about every 20 to 50 years. 
Uh, this doesn't mean that you can't have D3 conditions in two back-to-back -back years, nor does it preclude the fact that you might have an area that can go 50 years and not see those conditions. It just means that on average, this is the frequency that you could expect to see such events. So once these percentiles are determined for the various indicators, they're overlaying on a map, and a consensus of these parameters determines the final uh, drought category that's assigned. For example, uh, an area of might have precipitation indicative of D3 conditions, but say uh, stream flow, vegetation, and uh, soil moisture might align with D2 conditions. So that area would probably remain in the D2 category. And these categories don't always line up and conflicting signals may show up between them for a particular area. Each line on the map is drawn by a human. That's the, the drought author for that week. And that person makes the decision when there are areas that have parameters at different levels. Uh, the decision is aided by experts around the country in each state. And in Wyoming, we have also have authors each week who compile a recommendation for the state and send it into the national drought uh, author. And right now in Wyoming, the Wyoming compilers alternate between my office and the Cheyenne National Weather Service office. Uh, each week, the state's author prepares an initial map showing recommendations and asks for input from the conditions monitoring team, and then compiles that input and sends it along to the national author, who has the final say over what the, you know, what the ultimate decision of the, for the depiction will look like. And most weeks, our recommendations are taken. Uh, occasionally, some areas will be changed owing to the uh, additional information the author takes into consideration or our Recommendations may be accepted, but modified slightly, or the author may introduce changes that we had not made. So now let's take a look at the current map. This is uh, a few changes highlighted on here since the last briefing, and unfortunately most of those are degradations. Uh, some improvement here in the Trona, Converse, Carbon County area from the precipitation that we got there. and. Uh, went from D2 to D1 in this, this green area here. There were large areas of degradation, though, over the last four weeks, uh, notably the expansion of D3 in the northeast and down in central Sweetwater uh, County. Additional D3 or extreme drought was introduced in the southwest in Uinta, Lincoln, uh, Sweetwater, Sublette counties, as well as in uh, Park and Teton counties up here in the northwest. D2 or severe drought also filled in a lot of other areas uh, throughout the state. And if you squint, you can see down here that we are once again having some D4 in the state. Uh, this is the first uh, D4 or exceptional drought uh, since a two week period that ended the 19th of January of 2001. Uh, right now it only amounts to 0.08% of the state. And, but uh, prior to that last 12-week uh, period, you'd have to go back to the 9th of April in 2013 before there was any exceptional drought in Wyoming. With the exception of Albany, Laramie, Hot Springs County, all counties have D2 or worse conditions in them, and 15 counties uh, are at the D3 level or worse. Uh, this is 14-day precipitation, again, as a percentile for the state. Uh, some areas above the median here in the central part, some up here in the northeast, uh, bits up here in Hot Springs, Southern Park, and uh, uh, Northern Fremont County here. Some areas of concern here in the north central, northwest, and then down here in the south uh, southwest where uh, precipitation has been lacking. This is the same map, but at the 90 day period. And you can see it's somewhat similar in terms of areas of concern. It's just that they're a lot more intense. Uh, areas up here in Johnson Campbell, up into Sheridan, over into Crook County, the Northwest again, some, some real low in the second percentile or less conditions all throughout here in the Northwest. And then again, down here in the Southwest where we saw that new D3 that was added to the map here in the last two weeks. Uh, showing up uh, like quite a sore thumb there. And then again, this continuous area down here in uh, South Central Wyoming that's just been here for, for months is continuing. This is the standardized precipitation index. It takes the precipitation totals over a various time intervals, uh, fits them to a, a probability distribution, and then calculates you know, how many 
um, standard deviations that is away from the, uh, the climatological mean for the particular period of 30, 60, or 90 days. And thus the values are gonna be centered around zero with uh, the positive values being wet, as we're seeing here in uh, central Wyoming, and the negative values being in these yellow and red colors that we're seeing up here in the, in the Northwest. And you can see some of these areas that are perpetually, or at least in the last 60 and uh, 90 days long-term are showing some, some pretty poor conditions. And then you see the emergence of this uh, area here, of uh, wetter conditions in the central part of the state, which is what allowed us to remove some of that D2 here a little bit earlier in the month, uh, moving it to D1 conditions. This is the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, which is very similar to the SPI or the standardized precipitation index. Uh, it goes one step further and takes into consideration the, uh, the atmospheric demand of how thirsty the atmosphere is for water. And, and this gives you a, a little bit of an idea of the potential evapotranspiration that you could be seeing on, on the vegetation. These maps are also 30, 60, and 90 days. And you can see some of the same areas uh, vary in intensity. It's not showing up the same as it did on the SPI, but some of the areas are, same areas are still sticking out, like this, this central part of Wyoming here where we've got uh, a lot of that precipitation and which allowed those conditions to be improved. And then again, you can see over here in the West where uh, conditions have been going downhill. Uh, and you see it's in the, in the reds there down in the negatives. This is the 14 day average minimum temperature uh, over here on the left or on the right. And you can see now that our nighttime elevation, uh, even at high elevation, uh, we're seeing above 32. So we're, we're past the freezing part for most of the state, uh, even up at the extreme elevation. Some of these parts up here in the Northwest are only getting down into the you know, high, high 50s at night. And of course, a little bit cooler over here in the higher elevation. Looking at the 14 days as a departure from average, though, uh, tells more of the story. Uh, most of the state is about six degrees or, so, or up to six degrees above the average. A little bit higher over here in the Tetons, where you're seeing some of these reds here indicating nine to 12 degrees above average. And a few little isolated spots throughout the state where we're below average for nighttime lows, but very, very insignificant as far as the, the aerial extent of these. Uh, moving on to the maximum temperatures up here on the on the right again, you can see the um, the actual temperature as a you know, as a degree. And during the daytime, the highs are mostly getting above 60 degrees. We're seeing the, the lower elevations of the northeast and a little bit into you know into the Bighorn and into Fremont County here. Uh, you're seeing highs in the 85 to 95 degree range, obviously a bit cooler in the higher elevations down here in the Medicine Bows, Laramie range, and then generally in the 80s to mid 80s uh, for the rest of the state. And looking at again as a departure from the normal, you have again this small area down here in the southeast that's uh, a little bit below the average, uh, upwards of three degrees below average, but only for a, a small amount down here in Laramie County. And on the opposite end of the state, you can see, you can see up here in the six to nine degrees above average for the you know for the daytime highs. For the large part of the state here in the in the three to six range, and then the rest of it here, generally in the in the southeast quarter, is in the zero to three above average. Soil moisture, uh, again, this is looking like a pretty bleak picture here. Uh, we've, we've gone downhill again in the last two weeks. Uh, pretty much any place in the state that could go down with a little bit of exception over here and so forth has gone down at least one category, except for the, you know, the Southeast here, we're still in the 10th to the 20th percentile, uh, but a huge, huge portion of the state now is, in, uh, is less than the second percentile for soil moisture. And, it's, it's just not looking good in terms of that. And again, we'll show a, a, a one particular station, this being Thunder Basin Grasslands, which is on the, uh, the Campbell Converse County line. And this is about where we showed it last, uh, right about in here was about where we showed it during the last presentation. And it was coming down pretty consistently from there. We had some precipitation the end of June, getting into July, which uh, brought things up at the 10 centimeter level here. Uh, 
but then it started coming down again. And that precipitation during that period of time there, about all it really did was it gave it a little bit of a bump at the lower depths, uh, you know, down to a meter here at this, uh, or half a meter here at this uh, uh, palish yellow color. But all it really did was sort of level off the decline. Now, in the last couple of days, we did have another bit of precipitation events up there, which did bring it up at the shallower depths. But you can see that uh, even after that, we're, we're starting to decline immediately after that spike. And we really didn't even see a reaction yet here at the, at the 40 and 50 centimeter level. This is a timeline showing uh, drought in Wyoming. It's been updated to reflect what's been in the conditions this morning with the drought monitor that came out. Uh, you can see we're starting to go up in area as far as you know the D3 here, kind of similar to what we saw in 2013 and that 2012-2013 drought. And the question is, are we going to do one of these things where we come up a little bit here and then drop down? Or do we see what we did back here in 2004 where it came up and then continually went up? Uh, the 2007, 2000, or 2006, 2007 drought was fairly similar in terms of uh, what it looked like response-wise uh, in the second year of it, with it coming up a little bit and dropping off as it did in 2012. And it looks like we're coming in for a repeat of that. But what happens once we get up into here, uh, the next few months are going to be pretty critical. And this is taking a look at just uh, the 2020 through current, sort of an expanded view of that timeline to give you a little bit more uh, weekly detail in there. And you can't see it on here, but here's that D4 that I mentioned earlier uh, at 0.08% of the state uh, now in the D4. But as you can see, we really have come back up again in terms of the, the D2 coverage, the D1 coverage. And in fact, the D2 is about as high as it was except for this uh, blip here in earlier part of this year as it was during the first portion of the drought. And so with that, I will turn it over to Aaron Fiaschetti with the USGS who will talk about surface water. Thank you, Tony. Um, I just wanted to give a, just start off here, I'm just giving a brief update about where we should be on the hydrograph in Wyoming in general and just kind of pointing out that we should be somewhere on that falling limb of the hydrograph. We should generally have pretty good water supply conditions and approaching base flows for the summertime. And, and this certainly varies depending on where you are and your proximity to the mountains or uh, access to, to snowpack and runoff. So. So this is kind of where we should be, but it's not really where we are. So you could, so here's just a look at the seven day average stream flow from Water Watch and uh, just showing a lot, of, a lot of below normal, the orange, red, and that uh, really bright red means uh, very low conditions that we have some of that to the west in the, in the south, but you know, in general, that the green, those green values, when you take a look at them, you know, we characterize normal as twenty-five to seventy-five percent per, uh, within those percentiles, and generally they tend to be um, below the median or the, I guess you could think of it as the average too. So they're normal, but they're they tend to be low and. Um, and probably some of what we're seeing is a little bit of a bump from precipitation where you have green and others could be uh, a result of management also. You could advance here. So compared to what we saw last month, uh, basically the, the Western two thirds of the state decreased in flow in the pink box. And then there is some improvements in flow in the, in the blue and that, Seems like that might have been related to some rain that came through on July 5th or after, um, or it could be related to some sort of other management factor on the, on the creeks. So um, moving on, if we take a look at the trends in stream flow in the last 45 days on the axis of this graph on the right, it's the percent of stream gauges in Wyoming 
right now it's showing 50 sites. We have more than that. So that's a zero to 100% of the gauges. The green would be the normal. The blue would be below normal, red, much below normal. And then the very red is low. So you just see in the last 45 days since July 1st that the amount of stream gauges below normal is increasing and the amount of stream gauges above normal is decreasing. And, and we're getting to the point when we look at um, flows observed on this day that we have seven gauges showing that they're having the record lowest flow for this day ever. So that's, that's pretty striking and I'm sure that'll continue on. Next slide, please, Tony. So there's a, a new tool that's the um, National Streamflow Dashboard, and that allows to integrate the drought monitor. So just kind of looking at how our current, we're looking at current streamflow conditions in this map for today compares to the drought monitor, it seems like it's it's generally pretty good, but we're seeing some really low, low conditions kind of in the west and the snake that seem like they might might not align super well. But then you also have the the green green in there also. But uh, it seems like in the northeast corner too that you um, see some normal conditions, but that could be a reflection of current conditions on the ground today and not a reflection of long-term stream flow conditions up there. Um, but it's nice to be able to have this map to compare um, current stream flow conditions and the drought monitor. And we got a couple photos in from our Riverton field unit here down in the southwest corner in the Black Fork, Black's Fork above Smith's Fork on the left. Of, um, looking really low, and then Muddy Creek near Hampton, both tributaries of the green um, is, is dry. So, and I, I think we have one other that might be going dry soon. Um, the, the Bear River in the, I believe it was Bear River near Pugsley is a little, little red dot in that black box in the upper right hand corner was quickly approaching very, very low conditions here. So, and we'll, we'll try and, I'll try and bring more photos as we, we get them in and make those available. Uh, next slide, Tony, please. So just kind of to bounce around the state and have a look at what's going on up in the Northwest. It seems like the big horn at Kane is starting out in, um, well, I guess we're starting. Oh no, I forgot to update that graph. So we'll just skip that one. But the North Fork of Shoshone uh, was near, near normal conditions coming off a runoff, but now it's falling much below coming into the middle of July. The Snake River above Jackson Flag Ranch is never really kind of reached normal flows during runoff and it's still continuing to trend much below normal as we come into the middle of July here. If we move over to the northeast. Oh, the next slide, please. So just looking at reservoir contents in the, the northwest here, um, the reservoirs in the Bighorns seem to continue to maintain the storage they had compared to last month and the reservoirs in the Snake lost storage compared to last month. Um, <clears throat> so moving over to the Northeast here, um, there's looked like some recent rain maybe had moved through, but the Tongue near Decker seemed like that was got pretty close to normal near the near the peak of the hydrograph for the year and then it's just continued to drop off and fall farther below normal. Coming over to the powder near Arvada, just much below normal. And uh, you can see here in the starting in June, either some rain or 
maybe some calls for water management there had bumped up flows a bit recently, but it seems like it's starting to drop off again here. And then the Cheyenne River near Spencer seemed like it was kind of chugging along pretty close to, to normal, fell a bit below normal. And then there's a, a spike in flow here in the early part of July and uh, continuing above normal for a bit. So the, I guess they didn't have a whole lot here on the Northeast reservoirs, but it seems like some reservoirs had gained a little bit or maintained their storage compared to last month. So not a lot of change there. And it seems like most of those reservoirs pictured here are in South Dakota. So moving down to the southeast where it seems like uh, was a little more of a bright spot in the state for flows, but um, the encampment was got pretty close to the normal for the peak, but it's again fallen off. I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but um, yeah, much below normal coming into mid-July here. Um, looking over at the North Platte near the Wyoming-Nebraska line was below normal, now is bumped up. I would assume that was a result of management on the river, but I'm sure someone could provide more context on why those flows are near normal now. And then going over to the Laramie River, um, a close to or slightly above normal, and then uh, dropping off here as we come into the later part of June into July, falling below normal. If we go on to the reservoirs, um, generally most reservoirs lost storage. Um, and then we have a few small reservoirs here, which Jeff was kind enough to point out that those are re-regulation reservoirs and operate near full so during the season. So they've maintained their storage. So, but in general, everything else decreased in storage compared to June. We can move on to the southwest corner of the, of the state. This is, seems like where we were having really low, low conditions. Uh, if you look at the Green River up at Warren Bridge, came a little bit above normal in early June, and then it's fallen pretty far off below the normal, below the average into end of June. The Bear River below Pixley Dam near Coatville. Oh, that was a very, very low one. It's less than a CFS as of yesterday. So way, way, way below normal here, approaching dry conditions. And then the Blacks Fork near Little America, um, just way, way below normal. Uh, there was a, a bump in flow here towards the end of July or end of June, early July, but starting to fall back off again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then southeast, southwest Wyoming reservoirs, uh, basically everything lost storage except for Fontenelle and Flaming Gorge only went down a percent. So uh, on a bright spot, uh, Fontenelle gained some water. So we'll leave it on that. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, next up is Jeff Cowley with the State Engineer's Office. We'll talk a bit about uh, Water Rights Administration. Thanks, Tony. This is Jeff Cowley, North Platte Coordinator for the State Engineer's Office. Here you can see uh, the state divvied up into our divisions and districts. Um, there are, give or take, um, in Division One, lower right-hand corner, there are three streams that have regulation. You could also include in that the North Platte below Pathfinder, as we are now in an allocation year for the rest of the year, which really just deals with um, diversions from the river below Pathfinder. Um, Division two, there are 11 streams that are on call. That's just been updated. I don't know if, um, I just got the update from Dave Schroeder a few minutes ago, so the map might not exactly reflect that. Uh, we didn't have time to update it. Uh, Division three has nine streams. Uh, and Division four has 11 streams that are currently under call. Um, we have 
uh, three of the four superintendents on the call. So I might pose a question to them to answer at the end, but um, I don't know if this is normal for the year, uh, for a year like this with such low soil moisture and low precip, and as we've seen, low stream flows. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, there aren't that many calls. It, it, to me, there should be a lot more, but they can answer that later. Maybe it's because the streams are so dry, there's no water to call for, so people just aren't calling. So that could be, and, and I might pose that to those folks to answer at the end, but um, we've got some contact information over here on the left if you have specific questions for each one of those um, divisions. And um, we divide the state up a little differently than other folks, so this map might help um, define where you are in the world. You might think you're much closer to Lander, so you should call that office, but if you're on the Sweetwater, you're going to need to call Torrington. So um, we, we divvied up the, the state by water and, and river basins, so that might be a little different for folks. Um, and other than that, I think that's about all I have for today. Thanks, Jeff. Now, next up is Aisha Wilkinson with the Cheyenne National Weather Service to talk a little bit about uh, weather forecasts and the outlooks. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Aisha Wilkinson again. Um, I'm gonna talk about first the QPF forecast, which means the liquid precipitation forecast. Um, how much rainfall are we getting? So um, mostly this is a forecast, just so you know, um, it's not definite, but this is uh, a forecast of what we think is going to happen in the next seven days. So it looks like mostly um, the Eastern parts of Wyoming will see quite a bit of rainfall, not much, but um, good is better than, some is better than nothing, right? So around 0.25 to uh, 0.5 um, rainfall, mostly for the eastern parts and some of the central parts of Wyoming. Um, so the southeastern Wyoming, I know they've been getting a lot of rain. They'll also see 0.25 to 0.5 uh, rainfall, but the parts that need it the most, I know northern Wyoming, um, they need that rainfall, but uh, most likely will be around a trace to around 0.25 inches. Um, so, central, central Wyoming, uh, Carbon, um, Niobrara, uh, Natrona, those counties won't see much rainfall at all in the next seven days. Um, so if you're looking for rain, bad news, I'm sorry about that. Uh, these storms will most likely be isolated um, today and into the weekend for the entire state of Wyoming. So we're not seeing any major rainfall events at this time. Um, majority of this rainfall, the bulk of this rainfall will happen on Saturday afternoon and next Thursday afternoon. So um, we're not getting much rainfall uh, throughout the seven day period. For the next slide, I'm going to talk about the uh, six to 10 day precip and the six to 10 day temperature um, outlook. So this is just the probability, meaning this is just the chance. Um, and this is a 30 year climatology um, estimate of what's favored for the next six to 10 day outlook. So as you can see, it's below normal for mostly of Wyoming, um, some parts of the Eastern and central Wyoming will most likely see below normal favored conditions, but then the western corner portions near Sweetwater, um, they could see some above normal favored, which is good because that's what we saw kind of in our QPF forecast. So overall, you'll get some type of rain. It just won't be enough for what we want. Um, and that six to, six to 10 day temperature outlook um, above normal is favored. So we're gonna have some strong upper 80s to upper 90 temperatures favored across the state. So it's going to be hot um, across the state of Wyoming. Looking in the next slide, the eight to 14 day outlook, it doesn't get much better. Um, that's still below normal favored for a majority of that um, Eastern portions of Wyoming. Um, you do have some mix of equal chances um, in central um, and northern portions, Sheridan County. Um, I know they need rain as well, so there's a chance that we could get some storms up there and to produce some rain, but it won't be significant. Um, some portions of 
Western Wyoming will get some above normal favored in the eight to 14 day outlook. But again, this is just an outlook of, of a 30 year climatology period, um, comparing it to a 30 year climatology period. So um, the eight to 14 day is similar to what we had um, in the last outlook above normal temperatures again for the entire state. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to music festivals, Cheyenne Frontier Day is happening. So if you are outside, be sure to hydrate. And for my last slide, I wanted to highlight the uh, CPC. Um, they are highlighting majority of Wyoming in excessive heat. Um, so we were talking about those uh, strong temperatures, um, mostly for uh, into even early August, uh, we're going to see this excessive heat happening. So the hazardous outlook shows from July 22nd to the 28th, um, excessive heat for majority of Wyoming, and then another two week hazardous outlook that um, the Climate Prediction Center puts out, CPC, um, they put out a hazardous outlook for heat as well for a two week period. So it's showing majority of the state in moderate excessive heat. Um, what that means is it's most likely going to be above 90 degrees. Um, so if you are planning on doing outdoor activities and things like that, please make sure to stay hydrated because excessive heat is really dangerous. Um, that's all for me and I'm willing to take any questions or, or comments at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Our next speaker is Eric Chapman with the BLM, who's going to talk about green up and the fuel status, as well as the, uh, the wildfire outlook. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Chapman. I'm the uh, AFMO fuels for the High Plains District BLM in Casper, Wyoming, um, basically covering the northeast corner of the state. So uh, continuing with the theme here. Um, we are using the energy release component to measure our fuel status that we currently have. Um, again, that's to recap, that's the potential total energy release per unit area within the flaming zone of the fire. Um, this combines both the live and dead fuel moisture. So it gives us a pretty good broad, broad spectrum of where we lie. Um, and these percentiles again, based on that May through September values for the last 15 years. So currently in Wyoming, as you can see on the map to the right, um, we have a pretty good dramatic dip in the ERCs compared to when we last gave this presentation. Um, last time we were looking at the 80th to 90th percentiles with 97th percentiles across the southern end of the state. Uh, as you look at it now though, we've moderated that considerably. So primarily due to the precipitation that we received most likely due um, uh, early July. And I believe that's kind of where it's got our, our ERCs a little bit more in the green and the yellow. Um, in the Southwest though, we're still looking at very dry conditions along that I-80 corridor, corridor, excuse me, and uh, in the Sierra Madres and the Snowy Mountain Range. Um, obviously a direct correlation to drought. If you look at this, uh, where we've got the, the varying colors, um, especially the 50th to 79th percentile stuff, we, you know, that correlates to what you saw with Tony's presentation as well as what Aaron described. So we are, Expecting those fuels starting to cure at the low to mid elevations to continue. Um, as the precip comes, it does delay that just a little bit, but mostly just in the, uh, the moisture content of those fuels. Um, where we've seen most of our cheatgrass, we see that most all of that is, uh, is cured, at least in our zone. At the higher elevations, um, the, the fuels are continuing to um, approach that, that peak green up uh, or have started to transition into that, that cured or moving towards cured. So what, the, what does that mean to us? We're looking at the continued um, fire occurrence in uh, lower elevations where we've got that, um, that curing event going on. And we're gonna be anticipating more increased fire behavior or fire occurrence, I guess, at the, at the higher elevations. Next slide. Okay, so for our wildfire activity to date, Again, it's, it's, uh, we've had significant fire activity across the state since those last presentation. Um, currently, since that, that wedding event that we received early July, uh, we haven't seen quite the fire activity that we were expecting, which is, is a welcome kind of reprieve for most of the crews that have been out there. Um, so currently in Wyoming, we don't have any new large fire events. Um, there is a fire, Middle Fork, uh, 75 acres. That fire is uh, just east of Thermopolis. And then we're looking at the gravel fire 
which is uh, not shown on this map, but is just east of Flaming Gorge Dam. Um, we did pick up a couple of fires going on right now on the Bighorns, looking at my map, as well as one just east of Casper, but they're in the initial attack phase. So we're continuing to see these fires burning actively in, all, in a variety of all fuel types, whether it's higher elevation or out in our lower elevation country. Um, increased fire activity in our neighboring, neighboring states as well, uh, northern Colorado, as well as southern Montana, and then we're seeing a uh, an uptick in fire activity in that northeastern corner of the state, as well as in the South Dakota Black Hills area. Next slide. So for our wildland fire outlooks, um, what we saw for, for July is, is kind of coming to fruition that we saw in the last presentation. Um, so looking into this August projection, anticipating that to continue where it's almost uh, all of the state, except for the southeast corner is, is looked to, to have an increase or uh, a high fire occurrence and then maintaining that one to two month fire occurrence is basically still ahead of schedule. Uh, this is activity we typically expect to see in August and September. Uh, we're seeing a, at least a month ahead of time. So looking out into September, uh, we are anticipating the same except for migrating further east into the Nebraska panel. So. There are continued concerns uh, due to the consistency between what we saw July uh, or, or early July, what we can expect in, in uh, late July and August to, uh, especially with this, this heat coming that uh, Aisha talked about, uh, absolutely gonna increase that, that probability of fire occurrence. So uh, with that, I will pass on my stuff and answer questions at the end of the presentation if there are any, thank you. Thanks Eric. And now, Wendy Kelly with the UW Extension and the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub will wrap us up and talk about how you can get involved. Great. Thank you, Tony. So again, I'll just talk briefly about how you can get involved um, and how you can help to inform the U.S. Drought Monitor map, which Tony presented um, at the beginning of the, the webinar. So this is today's map that came out and there are several ways that you can help to inform it as well as your many stakeholders. So we always like to end the webinar with this information. So go ahead, next slide, please. So as a reminder, there is a program called COCO Raws, which is a citizen science um, program where you can register to record or uh, report your precipitation on a daily basis or lack of. So the zeros are really important when there's no precipitation. We all know how variable it is out on the landscape. The map on the left-hand side of the screen is today's map as of seven o'clock. You can see a number of zeros reported uh, throughout the state with the exception kind of down in that southeast corner uh, of the state. This information is pulled into the drought monitor are considered. Um, it's one of the many, many variables that's considered. So it's an important program to be a part of if you can and to share with your stakeholders. Next slide. The next program I wanna mention is the Condition Monitoring Observer Report System. You can see that there's a bit.ly link on the slide where you can find uh, this reporting system. This is the national database where individuals can submit reports, whether it's related to crops, livestock, fire, among others, you can see at the very top of your screen. And it's for everything. So it says condition because it's everything from severely dry to severely wet conditions that they want reports on and, and everything in between. Uh, this is the map as of this morning of the reports throughout Wyoming. Uh, you do see in the eastern part of Wyoming one blue dot and that individual just accidentally clicked moderately wet. I think they intended to click moderately dry based on the report that they wrote. Um, it's important to submit reports to the system. It can help to raise the flag, so to speak, uh, and draw our attention to areas where there might be issues um, that we need to take a closer look at. So whether if it's the Wyoming Condition Monitoring Team or the U.S. Drought Monitor Team and others that use this database. Next slide. A couple of notes on the um, Seymour system. One, I encourage folks to submit a report 
um, regardless of conditions, you know, pick the first or the 15th of each month to go in and submit a report and let us know how things are going out on the ground. The second tip and one that I'll continue to note is to submit comparison photos. You know, pictures are worth a thousand words. As you can see on the right hand side, it's showing an area um, from one year to another. So what does the what does the stock water area look like in a good year on July 15th versus this year? And that tells them more of the story because we're looking throughout the entire state of Wyoming. And then for the drought monitor authors, they're looking you know, throughout the nation. Um, we're getting some good pictures coming into the Seymour system and myself and others look at that system, uh, that report um, system every single week. Uh, the, the issue is, is that a single photo and a single point of time um, doesn't tell the story. So again, as you interact with folks or you submit reports, if you can provide comparison pictures, it's invaluable. The last thing I wanna mention is if you have issues with loading Seymour, it could be a web browser issue. So if you're on Internet Explorer, try Firefox or Chrome and another web browser. The last thing I wanna mention here is that Seymour does have a way that you can submit field reports now. They have a fact sheet, which you can find at the bit.ly link on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and um, you can go in there and it'll walk you through how to do field um, report. And with that, the, the final slide, I wanna thank all of the presenters today Tony Bergantino with WORDS and State Climate Office, Aaron with USGS, St uh, Jeff with the State Engineer's Office, Aisha, National Weather Service Cheyenne, Eric with BLM. Um, and we did have a couple of other BLM and State Forestry Division folks lined up and they're out on fire. So just wanted to, to make note that we're thinking of them and their teams. On the right hand side, of the screen are the websites that were shared throughout today's presentation. And if you do want to learn more about how the drought monitor is created, check out the link at the top on the right hand side.